A ship owner was about to send to sea an emigrant ship. He knew that she was old and not over well built at the first, that she had seen many seas and climes and had often needed repairs. Doubts had been suggested to him that possibly she was not seaworthy. These doubts preyed upon his mind and made him unhappy. He thought that perhaps he ought to have her thoroughly overhauled and refitted, even though this should put him to great expense. Before the ship sailed, however, he succeeded in overcoming these melancholy reflections. He said to himself that she had gone safely through so many voyages and weathered so many storms that it was idle to suppose she would not come home safely from this trip as well. He would put his trust in Providence, which could hardly fail to protect all these unhappy families that were leaving their fatherland to seek for better times elsewhere. He would dismiss from his mind all ungenerous suspicions about the honesty of builders and contractors. In such ways, he acquired a sincere and comfortable conviction that his vessel was thoroughly safe and seaworthy. He watched her departure with a light heart and benevolent wishes for the success of the exiles in, her, in this, their strange new home that was to be. And he got his insurance money when she went down in mid-ocean and told no tales. That was the opening thought experiment of William Clifford's essay titled The Ethics of Belief, uh, in which he's talking about uh, whether what we believe has ethical implications, and not just in its effects, but rather whether there are ethical requirements on what we actually believe, or what we choose to believe, uh, what propositions we can come to accept. Uh, so he, uh, he actually summarizes uh, really shortly uh, in, his own, in his own essay his point, uh, and near the end, he quote, to sum up, it is always wrong everywhere and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. So this is his claim. The claim he's making by the thought experiment uh, and by several other examples uh, is that any time you choose to make a belief, right, you choose to assent to a proposition, so you choose to say, this is true. Uh, any time you say that, you have a moral responsibility, according to Clifford, to have a good evidential reason for believing that. Now we can see from the example that there are clearly cases in which that, that it's obviously the case that we should have, uh, we should have some good evidential reasons uh, for believing things, right? especially when, uh, when those beliefs have consequences. So like with the ship owner, so the ship owner, um, we would say not only has a responsibility to his passengers and that doesn't just involve uh, getting them on the ship and getting them across the sea, but that involves knowing his ship and knowing certain things about it. So it, it has an epistemological component, a belief component. Um, so a, a requirement for what kinds of things the owner has to know. And so Clifford brings up uh, a, a sort of an addendum, a change to the situation. He says, well, what if it were the case that, uh, that the ship had sailed um, without incident? It had made it to its destination just fine, and everyone had gotten there. Um, he says, though, in that case, had the ship owner undergone the exact same preparations, mental and, uh, and financial and etc., so if the ship owner had gone, undergone exactly the same preparations in those circumstances, including having to talk himself into believing that the ship was seaworthy, despite reasons to believe otherwise, that he would be equally morally culpable as if the ship had, in fact, crashed and sunk and everyone had, uh, had perished from it. Now, this is a question far broader than, uh, than Clifford treats. Uh, it generally referred to in philosophy as the problem of moral luck. It's been uh, discussed by countless other thinkers going back at least to Aristotle. Uh, and I may treat that specifically in another video, but suffice it to say, to understand Clifford's point, he isn't talking about the consequences of believing a certain thing, right? That's not what he's judging. Because if that's what, we, what he were judging, if that's, all he were, if, uh, if that's all he were after, then it would make a substantial morally significant difference whether the ship made it to its destination or not. He's saying here that 
as far as moral responsibility goes, it doesn't matter if you happen to be right in a belief or if you happen to be wrong. If you didn't have the evidential justification to be sure that you're right, Clifford would say that you're being morally irresponsible in coming to believe that. So another example he gives uh, is, so there are, um, the example is of, uh, of people in a, in a certain community that are uh, accusing certain people of, of teaching dangerous heretical beliefs to children. Uh, and so they, they gather a bunch of charges and uh, they prosecute these people and they make, not only do they legally prosecute them, they make them, make them social pariahs based on scant evidence that they've been doing something untoward, uh, but because they, because the people doing the accusations had been led to believe it, right? They, they came to believe that the accused were doing something wrong. Uh, and so because of that, they, they went on to, to prosecute and persecute them. Clifford says that that was irresponsible of them and that it was immoral of them. And we can see a parallel to this uh, in, in modern, uh, especially civil law, uh, as opposed to criminal law. This isn't necessarily the case in criminal law. It certainly is in, um, in civil or tort law, uh, where if, <clears throat> if someone brings a, a, a frivolous lawsuit, and so say a prosecutor brings a, or a, a plaintiff, I suppose, brings a, a, friv a frivolous lawsuit, um, there are circumstances under which that if it is significantly frivolous, that can constitute harassment, and the defendant in that case can countersue for damages incurred by the legal case. Right? So we have the inbuilt in that idea, which, which seems uh, relatively in line with our, with our moral intuitions. Right? We want to say that, oh, hey, Angel, you can come up. Up. All right, there we go. This is Angel. Angel says hi. Um, right, but that seems that sort of court case seems in line with our moral intuitions. It seems like the right kind of response to someone bringing an unjustified lawsuit. Um, it, it, it's certainly the case for uh, for a lot of the uh, the cases for tort reform, saying that this should sort of be the default. Uh, but again, that's that's a bit of a, a, a wide issue that goes a bit far afield of what I was talking about. But uh, I think it illustrates it. So the point is that if we think that it, it makes moral sense to say that if somebody brings forward, uh, in this case, a lawsuit or a, even something like defamation, uh, if somebody says something about you um, without sufficient evidence, right? So if they don't have evidence enough to be sure about it, then we would say that it would be unjustifiable for them to do so, and it would be, it would be unjust to the extent that the person... Uh, that they're accusing would have a right to recompense if it had sufficiently harmed them. Right? But this, this relies on the idea that, that if someone, if we say that someone does something wrong, and Clifford argues that we, it's very clear that someone did something wrong in cases of negligence like this, uh, whether it's the ship or whether it's the, the, uh, the sort of angry mob of, of prosecutors, in, in any kind of case like that, he wants to say that they've done something wrong, especially, especially, but not only if things turn out for the worse. Right? In cases where it does turn out for the worse, it's easy for us to see that they've done something wrong, that they are, that they're liable for wrongdoing. He says specifically that they, that, that the ship, the ship owner in the first case is clearly, let me see, if, uh, let, me, let me quote this exactly. Uh, Surely this, surely we can say that he was verily guilty of the death of those men. So he was guilty of the death of the passengers on the ship. Not just that, uh, not just that he bears some responsibility. He's guilty of their death, Clifford argues, right? So this is a, this is a moral condemnation, uh, not just an description, uh, not just ascribing some responsibility to him. And so he argues that for, if that, for that to be the case, and some of this is implicit, but uh, this, is, this goes into the depths of, our, our, um, of ethical theory that, again, a little bit broad for this essay or this video. But he relies on the notion that 
for something to be, for you to be morally responsible for an outcome, it has to have been your choice to, to, to cause that outcome. Otherwise, this is why we have things like accidents, unforeseen accidents, where someone isn't necessarily held responsible for something. Like if I were to, if I, if I forgot that Angel were sitting here right, on my lap and I, I, I just stood up suddenly and then she, she falls to the floor and she gives me that really sad look that cats do when you tip them off of you, right? Maybe I'd feel guilty, but I don't know if I'd be morally responsible for tipping the cat on the floor, right? Similarly, if the, if the ship owner had no reason to think that his ship uh, were unseaworthy, so he'd had it thoroughly inspected. He'd gone through every uh, every precaution that he reasonably need to take, and yet it still went down um, on the journey due to an unforeseen storm or uh, or what have you. Right? Piracy, uh, mechanical failure, well, anything. We would not say that that's his fault because he did everything that was morally necessary to be sure. He gathered sufficient evidence. It just turned out the other way. Right? We don't want to say he's morally responsible in the same way as if it was by his negligence, by his not justifying his beliefs about the seaworthiness of his ship. So this is why we have the. This is why Clifford says that there we have the exact same moral condemnation, no matter how something turns out. So even if the ship, even if the ship had sailed on and made its journey just fine, the owner is still responsible. He's still ethically responsible. He's still done something wrong by not making sure that his beliefs are correct, right? Because the only difference, uh, the only difference in the in, in the situation is the outcome, which was. In that case, not up, not within his control. All that was in his control, and so we would think all that he can be morally blamed for, uh, is his evaluation of the situation and what he did about it. Right. So, why? Why this emphasis? In addition to in addition to the arguments here, what we see the emphasis of of uh, well, we say that that epistemology, so coming to know things is normative, which is to say that we ought to believe things that are true. Right? This is, this is uh, one of our most fundamental epistemological notions. It's even one of our most fundamental moral notions. And it traces its way back all the way through uh, the history of Christian philosophy uh, and also back to, um, to what can vaguely be described as Socratic philosophy. So um, back to both Plato and Aristotle, so what they had in common. And the idea has a, it has a striking similarity to, to uh, something I've mentioned in another video, which I'll have a link to in the description, uh, the, which there is the convertibility of being and goodness. So being, when it's something that exists, something that is maximally, is also maximally good, right? So Or things are good insofar as they exist. Right? Now I mentioned that this is a subcat in that video, I mentioned this is a subcategory of the doctrine called the, the convertibility of the transcendentals, which again goes back through Christian history, uh, throughout, uh, through classical theism as well. Um, you, you'll find this in, in, um, in Jewish thought, in some strands of Islamic thought, um, and you'll also find it in, uh, in both the Platonic and the Aristotelian traditions. Um, and so it doesn't merely reduce to being and goodness being convertible, right? So it doesn't mean that only being and goodness are the same thing. In addition, not only are being and goodness the same, but all of what we call the transcendental qualities, um, among these are being goodness, uh, especially being goodness and truth. Truth is the, the major third. Uh, beauty is usually also included, although that is sometimes um, sort of gathered in together with goodness. So, what this is to say is that not only is, not only is something good insofar as it exists, but something is true insofar as it exists. And a statement is a, or a, a proposition or a belief is good as a belief insofar as it's true. 
and statements about things are true insofar as the thing exists, which is to say insofar as the thing is good. So the, the further, to use an analogy, the further up you go on the, the ladder of ontology, right, the closer you get to, to uh, God or the unmoved mover or the form of the good or what have you, uh, depending on which tradition you're going in, the closer you get to that, this maximal being, this, this, this that than which nothing greater can be conceived, to borrow Anselm's language, the closer you get to that, uh, the more you can see that truth, being, and goodness are all the same. So this is why, this is why traditionally, you know, especially in the West, um, although that isn't to say that, that truth hasn't been valued in uh, in other philosophical traditions, but it, it's been especially emphasized uh, in uh, Western philosophy, springing from um, from uh, both the ancient Greek tradition uh, as well as uh, carried through Christianity. The importance of truth, the importance of believing truth, and the intrinsic value of truth. Right? So Clifford here is arguing not only that. Um, not only that, that having false beliefs has bad consequences, because that's obvious. And he's not just saying, he's not only saying that, all right, well, and so, so on the other side, having good beliefs has good consequences, right? So believing true things about the world helps us to navigate the world. That's, that's pretty standard, and, and most, people, most people believe that. Almost no one denies it. Um, but he would also say, and he's very clear about this, that... that it doesn't matter what the results of our mistaken beliefs are. So if our, if our beliefs are untrue, and it's our fault that they're untrue, we have done something morally wrong. Right? We have, we've, we've, he says, committed a sin against mankind. Right? So we've, we've committed an epistemological sin. We've done our thinking wrong. And I mean wrong there in just the same way as if we committed a moral error in any other area. He makes this argument a bit differently, but it, it, it very clearly um, it very clearly follows the same tradition uh, that I've been discussing that that because being goodness and truth are, wind up being the same thing. If our beliefs are true, that means that they're in line; they're aligned properly to being, aligned properly to reality. Right. Uh, that's part of what it means for some for a statement to be true is for it to for for it to correspond to reality. This is the standard correspondence view of truth, uh, which again, that, that's, um, that's something for another time. But further, not only is, is a true belief one that corresponds to reality, right? So that these, these wind up being the same, but also one that is good as a belief. It's a good belief to hold, morally speaking, in addition to, uh, to just, um, in addition to just happening to correspond to what happens to be real, it is a good kind of belief to hold. Right. Now there are uh, there are also other there are other aspects to, or other implications that have been drawn that sort of thing from, um, from Clifford's essay, uh, especially in in relation to a lot of the thought at the time. There were there were questions of of evidentialism and fideism. Um, fideism, so, so belief solely based on faith or solely based on a uh, on a voluntary choice, um, or belief solely based on private mystical experience. So the the, um, the existentialists or uh, the mystics like Kierkegaard or William James come to mind. Um, though that's that's separate, I think, from uh, so those are implications of this of this essay. But that that's separate, I think, from the core here which is that truth has objective value, which is to say, epistemology, how we know things or that we come to know things, is normative. Right? There's a right and a wrong way of doing it, of coming to knowledge. And it's not just that there's a right answer, but there is a right path to the answer. Right. So if we happen across a true belief, that's not the same as coming to know it through evidence and through argument. I think that is that is the really the core of uh, 
what Clifford is talking about here. And I think the core that we should take away from this, and it is... I think also, not, well, whether this is a, whether this is a benefit or, or not of me having done this video, it's also, I think, one of the less, one of the most uncontroversial points to take away from Clifford, right? So we, we can, we, so going forward from this, the idea that, that certain kinds of truth can be known immediately, so, um, so mystical experience, or that we should choose what beliefs that we have and we should be radically free in doing that, so the existentialist point, um, or what kinds of things constitute evidence, uh, what kinds of things constitute an argument, all of these things can get into, uh, into disputable territory, and <clears throat> hopefully we can discuss that. Um, if, not, if not in video format, then you can, uh, we can discuss it elsewhere, you can discuss it, you can uh, come to these conclusions on your own as well. But I think this point, that truth, that knowledge, that coming to know truth, has intrinsic value is, I think, relatively uncontroversially true, or at least should be considered relatively uncontroversially true. Certainly, yeah. I don't know exactly where I was going with that, but but that is, that, that's really the key point, I think. So I think that's what we're going to take away from this, that that epistemology is normative in an important sense, not merely that there's, there's not merely that the truth, that things are true, but that we ought to believe things that are true. So, all right, uh, that's all I've got for today. Uh, so I will see you next time.